I had shin splints, I had lower back problems, I had a couple of fractured fingers, I had a shoulder injury. I'm pretty sure that was also related to load management and poor structure when it came to like the supporting strength and conditioning training. Hello and welcome. Today I'm here with Anya and Anya is physiotherapist, athlete, coach, entrepreneur, and business founder, business owner of Bulletproof Performance. So we will start, I would like to start with kind of your background, where you're coming from, how you got into sport, how you got into fitness, and just take it from there. All right. Thanks for having me. Um, well, my background comes mainly as a volleyball player. Um, I, I'm Norwegian and although volleyball isn't a big sport in Norway, where I grew up, we had one of the best female teams in the country at the time. Um, and two of my aunts were involved in playing. So sort of my whole family on my mother's side were involved in volleyball. Um, so it's a heritage. Almost. Uh, although my, like my parents didn't play much um but like i said my aunts were playing my grandparents would be there making and selling waffles for the team whenever there was a match and i would grow up running around playing catch in the spectator seats um and then i didn't really start playing until i think i was around nine ten um and nothing too serious but we were we were lucky we had a good coach um, is nine, nine, ten considered late for starting with volleyball? Yeah, I think nine, ten is it's not really early in any sport, is it? <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> sort of in between. Um, before that, I'd done. I did ballet actually for nine years. Uh, most people don't know that, but and I also did horse riding. Um, but then I started volleyball, and it quickly became the favorite. I think. And like I said, we were lucky we had a good coach in spite of being a, a junior team. So we were kind of, I would say, within the top five, ten junior teams in the country whenever we would play nationals. But then it wasn't really until I turned 15 and started high school, I moved away from home to go to a national volleyball academy that is called Top Volley Norway. Um, it's located deep inside one of the Norwegian fjords in the middle of nowhere. There is, I think, around 1,200 people living there. Oh, That's good it. for discipline, yeah? That's it. There's absolutely nothing to do but play volleyball. So <laughs> it's. I'm pretty sure they did that intentionally. Um, so I moved there when I was 15. Um, the academy today is incredible. It's amazing. Uh, the best volleyball players in the country for sure come out of that academy and the reason gold uh, medal beach volleyball players from Norway they both went there it's the whole system is is well developed and and running very well uh, now but when I started we were just the second class there so we were at the very beginning and we were I guess a bit the guinea pigs <laughs> and, and th oh, this is volleyball like the hall volleyball or beach volleyball or is it uh, how do you differentiate it yeah so at that point it was just indoor volleyball uh today they also have a, a indoor beach volleyball facility they have a full stack gym we had a gym probably as big as this room um which is not that big for those that are not here yeah it's not that big. <laughs> <laughs> and um although we had from the beginning we had amazing volleyball coaches we had coaches from japan brazil montenegro uh, all across the world, but we didn't have strength and conditioning coaches, physiotherapists, um, none of that. So we were sort of left to our own devices when it came to everything outside of the volleyball. Uh, I still remember the first tour we got of the gym where pretty much lasted for five minutes where one of the coaches went in and said, yeah, that one's for legs and that one's for upper body. That one's also for legs. And there you can do a little bit of everything. <laughs> and that was it. And abs on the floor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that was it. So, uh, and me also, I'm, a, I'm 172, 5'7", which 
although in this part of the world is is generally not considered short it most certainly is in the volleyball world um i was the third shortest girl i think really in my school and the two others were both setters or liberal players meaning they don't have to spike okay so when i came there i very quickly realized and learned the brutal truth that is that if you're a short volleyball player and you want to compete you're going to have to work harder than everyone else when just a side question when you reached this height what age um so i think i was already about that height when i started when i was 15 mm -hmm. uh maybe i gained one or two centimeters while i was there but i was already pretty much at that height um so we had some guys, they naturally often grow a bit later. So we had some guys that maybe came in at 180 and left at two meters uh, three years later. The but, pot potential was there. Yes. <laughs> but for me, that wasn't the case, um, which meant that I had to learn how to compensate for that height or the lack of um, instead. So I quickly learned that you're... Not just going to have to work as hard as everyone else, but you're going to have to work harder. Because if what you lack in height, you have to make up for in every other element um, on the court. So, and pair that together with kind of the lack of guidance, education, if you want, on when it came to strength and conditioning and physical part of it, I worked myself into a lot of unnecessary trouble. Um I tried. I tried so many weird things. <laughs> I would try. I would try anyone that anyone would tell me that was better at me at that point. Also, like the couch coaches, yeah. Anybody. Anything. What the older players were doing. If we had, we'd often have professional players that would come in for shorter periods of time, either to coach or to train with us. Uh, I would follow them in, them in the strength room and do whatever they were doing. Um, I would go online. I remember ordering. Um, a book called the vertical jump Bible <laughs> just to like, okay. okay, this is what I'm going to do now. So anything that would give me extra centimeters, uh, on my vertical jump, I was willing to, to do, but already from the beginning, it was a big change. It came from before I moved, we did, we had two volleyball trainings a week. That was it. Two times two hours. We played volleyball four hours a week. That was the that was the academy. No, program. that was before the academy. Oh, that was before the academy. Yeah, and then pretty much overnight we came to the academy and suddenly had close to twenty hours a week. And obviously, knowing now what I know, um, so for slow people slower in math, that five times more volume exactly a week. Yeah, which is not a great recipe <laughs> if you want to stay out of injuries. So mm -hmm. the first year. Most of our class exploded in shin splints um, as an overload uh, injury. We, um, <laughs> we the my first year there, the only connection um, we had with the physiotherapist was that we had a physiotherapist that traveled to get there, to come to us. And we had a one hour session with him, 50 students at the same time. Five zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. discussing shin splints <laughs> all about shin splints yeah. Yeah. so what they did what did they uh, tell you i have my kind of uh, way how to deal with shin splints not like i'm getting them i'm not running bad distances that it would uh, affect me or i'm not jumping that much but for some people i work with they do uh, what is the recipe you use uh well at the time we obviously shin splints is most of all about a load management injury uh it's a very common overuse injury and especially when you have any sudden changes to your loading um there's this saying that most overused injuries happened after doing too much too soon after doing too little for too long nice <laughs> yeah so going from four hours to 20 hours perfect recipe um, at the time, I remember that one of the girls in the year above me, she had struggled with the same and she told me, you need to run in the pool. So <laughs> for in the pool, in the pool. Okay. And we had this cause where we live, there is literally used to be a, a school way back. So there are three dorm rooms, a small cafeteria in the middle 
then there's 50 meters to the school on one side, and then there's 50 meters to the gym on the other side. So you live in this little bubble. Nice. Um, I, I was in this probably for most people a little bit unfamiliar concept, but you will know because you're from Norway. I was in Højskole in Denmark, yeah, which was exactly that kind of bubble. Yeah. Like we had, I literally was living two floors above our swimming pool and I could go to CrossFit gym, big basketball gym, all outdoor facilities, of course, but everything indoor was so connected that I didn't have to step out yeah. and I could get absolutely anywhere from dining to sleeping to pool to any gym and uh, yeah amazing bubble yeah, exactly <laughs> the bubble is good as long as you're happy in the bubble um, and then there might be some challenges if you're not how But long have you stayed there for three years Okay. Um, so my full high school years from, from 15 to, I'm born in December, so from 15 to 18. So this was your high school? Yeah. You did, so this was basically a high school oriented for volleyball training for extremely talented people. Exactly. So it's a national academy. They, they only accept around 20 players per year. So, but like I said, we were the second class there. So we only have one class above us. Um, so the first year we were about 45, 50 Students. So they're even more messed up than you were, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different challenges, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, about the shin splints, we we had this pool in the basement of one of our dorm rooms. So basically under an old gymnasium, and you had to go down these super dark, very steep stairs to get down into the dark, cold, freezing locker room. And then you can get in this little 12 meter long pool. Oh, 12 meter. Yeah. Well, good for running though. <laughs> yeah. And I would run back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth endlessly in this pool. C can you describe it a little bit more into detail? Because I have a hard time visualizing that. <laughs> like how deep you were in the water? Uh, how does the, like, what was the point of the running in the water? At the time, like I said, like we didn't have much, much guidance. So I went with whatever anyone would offer me as a possible solution I was willing to do. Mm -hmm. um, because at the time it was, it was restricting me from playing. It was restricting me from performing. So, so, there, any, so there's no more specific instruction than just run in the water, run in the pool three or four times a week. Uh, I would do about 40 laps every time, I think up and down the pool. So I would start about waist high, run until the neck deep and then back again. Oh, so it was declining a little, a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I managed to stay ahead above water. I was tall enough for that. <laughs> So yeah, I would do that, but luckily for me, it, it, it was at a level where it was manageable. Um, but, um, for most people who have suffered with shin splints, they will know that it's, it's something that you have to continue kind of being a bit cautious of. It's something that's easy to return if you first flare them up really badly And you have to be on top of monitoring your, your loading. Um, so the running itself helped a bit? It helps. I'm not sure if I did anything else. Like, um, I've, I'm sure that it was probably more that they wouldn't allow me to jump as much in practice. And that load management probably did more than what the running did. Looking okay. back at it now. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> so. you can't tell because, yeah. At the time I was 15 and I did whatever anyone would tell me. Um, would I have given that recipe today, probably not. Um, mm. But at the same time, like it serves like pool training, especially with overuse injuries can serve some purpose, right? Because you, you get to take, you get to continue your activity, but without the same amount of loading. Um, I found very, I don't know if you know, uh, knees over toes guys. Yeah. Yeah. So I found his approach very interesting also for this. So reverse drag, on the on the sled or the tibialis race yeah. i actually got a custom made tbl bar yeah. <laughs> for that and it seems to work pretty well yeah but yeah the load management will probably be the, the yeah. crucial part anyway yeah i would say the load management comes first and then looking at uh without going into too much details like doing a proper movement screen and looking at if there are anything going on especially with the foot ankle complex if that may contribute to someone taking unnecessary load um, mm -hmm. is is often something that can be 
quite triggering. So basically also generally assessing the movement pattern people are already using if that is not contributing to a higher chance of getting it. Yeah, yeah. Especially for, for athletes that have a lot of repetitive loading. So whether that's runners or jumpers of any sorts, um, then then assessing that movement pattern um, and the quality of those movement patterns is... And important. shoes? And shoes. Um, I think shoes... Um, or well, the shoe industry likes to go from one extreme to the other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so five, cent- five centimeter cushion to, to nothing. nothing. Yeah. yeah. And, and like everything in the world, there is usually not a black and white answer. Um, everything kind of depends. Um, I will say when it comes to the topic of insoles and very supported shoes, um, I think that, there's a place for it, but that, that the current place is probably bigger than it should be. I was actually, a couple of hours ago, I was reading one study where they were claiming that, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but there was something like 70% improvement in the foot strength for people who were using their like uh, barefoot barefoot shoes yeah. for at least six times a week for three hours. So not even like all the time, yeah. but this kind of improvement in the foot strength with, to me, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, if it's the foot strength, exactly what you need at that moment, if it's not going to overload or because many people starting with the barefoot, they have pain. Yeah. It, the discomfort is there for sure because they're not used to it. Yeah. I'm, big advocate of it. I would be barefoot everywhere yeah. if it's possible, but like real barefoot, not yeah. barefoot shoes. Yeah. Like just, you know, especially the toe spreading. Yeah. I find it, uh, I see it on myself that since I stopped being in a gym where it was 100% required that we have a certain brand, yeah, yeah. certain type because it was the newest model and it doesn't matter if it's squishing your toes or not. Luckily, the old Reebok Nanos were pretty wide. Yeah. They were pretty wide at the, at the front. front So it gave you enough, enough space for the toes, but it's nothing like being barefoot anyway. So yeah, I like barefoot, but you know, you also got to go to a weather where it's not really, I mean, I wouldn't even mind cold, but I don't want to get my feet burnt on the concrete yeah. here. You know? <laughs> it's actually worse. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, definitely. How do you actually do this in sand in the summer? In sand in the summer. Yeah. So now I play more beach volleyball uh, and that is definitely a challenge once it starts heating up here. Um, we tend to either play like right now, for example, when it's starting to get warmer, we play very early morning mm. and then the, cut off time becomes earlier and earlier. Um, so, so it's not like you get used to it, right? It's not possible. No, there are options. There are actually specially made sand socks that you can play with either for heat and or for cold, mm-hmm. um, where you almost play, it's almost like a barefoot shoe, just even more, uh, just of a sock. So it has like a protective layer at the bottom, which you can play with. They're not very nice tan lines. <laughs> is, it, you know, is it also toe separated no so i've seen the other day i've seen in the gym one lady and she actually had like toe so- separated thing on the feet uh, but i was far and i i was wasn't sure if it was a sock or if it was like this kind of something in between the sock or the shoe yeah. or the shoe and at the end it was a sock i didn't even know they make this yeah. like a uh, sock with uh all toes separated fingers. yeah yeah not bad. Interesting. Yeah, no. But in terms of the, the shoe discussion, um, I think that for most people today, we've, and this goes for more things than just feet and shoes, but we've we've outsmarted ourselves. <laughs> like our evolution has gone to the point where we've created life so convenient that it starts negatively impacting our health. And feet and shoes... Flat floors is one of them. Everything we walk on is now completely flat and even. We very rarely have to use our feet as much unless you spend time on the weekend hiking 
where you actually have to walk on an uneven surface. And with the cushioned and built up shoes as well, it often leads to your feet actually weakening and uh, becoming weaker, lazier if you want. And then that again can kind of ripple into to other issues further up your chain. So I would also say that leaning more towards a, a barefoot end of that specter is something that I would support. But like you mentioned, you it can't go from, I run in this five centimeter supported shoe one day, and then I'm going to go running for 10 kilometers in this barefoot shoe the next day, because I heard that was great. Then mm. that's also sure a recipe to something's going to start hurting because it changes up your uh, mechanics so much that it has to be a gradual transition. So just being aware of, of when you're trying to make that transition, that you do it gradually and ideally with some specific movements, exercises that can help support it um, along the way. And while you transition, for those that, for example, would come to me in the clinic already complaining of shin splints or heel pain, Achilles pain, and so on, there might be a, a phase where I would allow them and almost prefer them to have their insole or their more supported shoe in a transition period where the focus is on, on strengthening up their feet and improving the mechanics of their feet, but that they get that support in parallel until they're ready to start stripping it away. I have, I have a couple of ladies who, because of work requirement, they kind of need to have high heels, right? Which is probably the exact opposite of what we are meant to do, right? Because the heel is higher. It's not the most natural thing in the world. Yeah. Load is forward. Plus, because of the shape of it, the toes are just squished together. So, yeah, it's a constant challenge. Eventually, because they are training always barefoot with me, or in socks, but no shoes, eventually they got used to that habit that, okay, like we working on kind of the uh, muscle imbalance, tension, whatever it's creating, but also trying to limit as much as possible the time spent in these shoes. So they have another flats, uh, comfortable, basically slippers <laughs> for the office. So if they're not on the meeting, if they're only coming to the office and it's between the colleagues who knows them, just change it as fast as you can. And yeah, but it's a constant struggle, right? Yeah. It is. And luckily, I think there's becoming a broader acceptance of this. There's becoming, and especially now after COVID, when people have been working in their pajamas or their sweats for a couple of years, um, I think there's opening up to being more freedom in, into what you wear. And luckily, the trends is uh, quite sporty at the moment with a lot of sneakers and and joggers. So, yeah, I think it's it's like you, everyone has to find their balance. And of course, some might have job restrictions or whatever it might be that that can make it difficult, but then you you do what you can and you adjust where, where you're able. And then doing a bit of focused work on the side of that might be enough to, to keep things running quite smoothly. Yeah, you just reminded me something I used to always say when, you know, people like, oh, I don't feel like training. Okay, when you feel like 60% or if you can eliminate wearing that shoes to a 60%, do 100% of that 60. You know, just don't get don't get lazy just because oh, it's happening anyway and then you suffer more than you actually need to. So just, as you're saying, finding balance, but effort into yeah. it that where you're actually trying to maximize the beneficial behavior on the on the cause and not not being complacent with oh it's happening anyway and uh, I will just let it slip. Uh, exactly. I wanted to ask you before we go to your career and uh, on next volleyball. You, you mentioned ballet and horse riding. I'm very interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the horse riding. I did couple yeah. of horse riding also sessions and uh, it's super tough especially for legs. And I thought I was like, you know, like I do CrossFit. My yeah. legs are fine. <laughs> and I was sore on the places. I didn't know I can still be sore yeah. that much after 15 minutes on the horse. How you got into horse riding? Uh, you had a horse at home or? Yeah, so the horse riding I got into thanks to my dad. 
he grew up with horses. Um, he had race horses, trotting horses um, from a young age and had horses as well when I was little and growing up. Um, so he's the one that got me into horses and oh, it was a close call probably for a couple of years between Volvo and, and horses. Oh, um, really? Yeah. I'd just gotten, we moved um, just a few years before I moved to the academy. We moved in and took over my grandparents' farm. Before that, we, we lived in a regular neighborhood, uh, no space for a horse, although I insisted that we could make space in the garden. Uh, but then we moved and, um, and that's when I got my first horse. So, oh, okay. So this was a serious stuff. You actually had your own horse. Yeah. So then I got, I think they got tired of me nagging. I think for as long as I can remember, I've always, always wanted the horse, but I knew I had to like go through the grades. So it started out with when I was very little, we had bunnies and then we got cats and then we got a dog. And then okay, we're ready. For you're the horse. not riding on those, I hope. <laughs> no, but I knew I had to like go through the levels of responsibility. So, okay, so you were proving you're responsible exactly. to take care of it. Okay, exactly. So when we finally moved out, we even had the space for it. Um, that's when I got my first horse, and that horse had um, uh, we got a foal um, with that horse, and then I left and moved to the academy. <laughs> my dad was left with the horses. <laughs> <laughs> but he probably enjoyed it, right? Yeah, he yeah. does. See, we there's still horses on the farm, but they're not ours. We rent out the stable now. Um, but yeah, I think it will always be a part of my dad's life. Do you now, as a physiotherapist, and you know, that time you probably were not really thinking about it, but did you see or can you see now how horse riding benefited you for your volleyball? Because from my experience, I was also coaching couple of uh, well, most ladies who were doing horse, ri horse riding like their main thing. Yeah. And there, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody having such a great and balanced squat. Like yeah. the, the way you need to squeeze in and the way their adductors inside hamstring and everything, basically the legs were just working so great that not only they were strong, but there was extreme stability, which I was always amazed. And then after trying it a couple of times, like proper, proper riding, not like, uh, you know, kids on a fair just <laughs> thrown yeah. onto a horse and <laughs> do one lap, but like actually trying to do some techniques and, and stuff like it was uh, very eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. No, I definitely think... A lot of people, like you said, can can underestimate how much you actually work when you're when you're on a horse. Um, and typically, muscle groups and and areas that don't get much attention with your regular strength training or a lot of other sports. So, can it be a great complement to a lot of things? I definitely think. Yeah, that's. Uh I can still remember <laughs> the shock. <laughs> yeah. And then when you think about it, like, uh, I know it's Western movies, but it's based on something, right? And these people who were spending whole days in a saddle and then they were basically traveling because there was their way of transport, right? Like, I'm not, you know, always when you see this uh, European or from a medieval Europe uh, environment movies, like, like you would rather be the one on the horse than the one in the cart. Yeah. yeah. But then you do horse riding <laughs> and you really think about it twice, like where you want to be for days, yeah. you know, cause it's, uh, yeah. it's very tough. Yeah. Uh, do you do horse riding here? I don't, unfortunately I, I've have on a few occasions. Um, a couple of years ago, I actually coached, um, a guy from Uruguay who, ran an uh, endurance um, race horse stable. So oh, then nice. I got the chance to to go out into the desert and, and ride some horses there, which was amazing. I always love it when I I get the chance, but it doesn't happen very often anymore, unfortunately. So no horse riding? and Because, you know, it's a like a par paradox or f funny uh, funny balance when you look at it like you moved from Norway which is not really typical for volleyball yeah 
and you were horse riding there and you moved to a country where horse riding is basically part of a history, right? Yeah. And you have also shit ton of sand to do, <laughs> to do your volleyball. <laughs> uh, what about ballet? Yeah, ballet. It's a mystery to most, I think, especially my mother. Um, I don't think I've ever been, you can ask anyone who knows me, I don't think I've ever been considered like a girly girl. Um, hated pink when I was little. <laughs> Um, well, that's but, not a tragedy, right? But that, no. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do ballet, it might start. <laughs> but then when you when you look at the things that I did, it's like I did ballet, I did horse riding, I did volleyball. It's like, oh, okay. But versus all the girls in my my class, they all played soccer. Um, town where I'm from also had one of the best f- female soccer teams in the country. What kind of city is that? <laughs> No, strong girls in that city for sure. Well, well, generally we know that from north, yeah, north of the Europe, Iceland, Norway, yeah. there are. I mean, just to live there, survive there, <laughs> generational. You know, th- there needs to be something because, like, you people are probably way more tougher than south of the Europe. I would say, like, if you if you if you send me to a war. I would rather go with Norwegians and <laughs> Sweden people than with Greeks. You yeah. know? No offense to anybody. <laughs> yeah, no, I can agree. We've been watching uh, Vikings and The Last Kingdom lately. And, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would That's probably a... also make the same pick. <laughs> yeah, no, but the ballet, I started when I was, I think, four years old or something. Four. Um, not sure where it came from. I mean, I was too young to even remember why I wanted to start in the first place. But, and my mom, I, she's told me after, like, she thought it would just be like a phase, something I would do for six months and then get tired of it. But oh, then, she, she wasn't, she wasn't pushing you. She wasn't the one encouraging me. No, oh, okay. no, not at all. Um, so, so she thought it was just this phase that would pass, but then I kind of stuck with it. Um, and at some point, because uh, in ballet, you once you get older uh, and more experienced and you start training more, then obviously you transition into the point shoes um, where you literally like dance straight on your toes. You have this wooden cloth inside the front of your shoes and that you uh, dance on top of. But you have to be at a certain age and train a certain amount of hours per week to make sure that your feet again are strong enough to be able to handle it. And I think at some point someone told me about this and then that just became this like fixed goal in my head. I'm going to get to dance on those shoes. Okay. (laughs) So I refuse to quit before I get to that point. Um, But then I think in the end it was never, it was never something that was like, I was never the natural talent. You know, you'll have kids that, seem to just kind of be born into something or it comes very easy and natural for them. I don't think I was ever that person in anything that I did. Um, but I think I was always very I'm stubborn <laughs> and always very determined. So Well, that goes with the competitiveness, right? Yeah, so I would stick with it. and um, But then once I reached kind of that point, I... I guess I didn't have any next big goals with it. And then at the same time, volleyball kind of took took over and became more the favorite. So how long was this phase going on for? Nine years. Nine years of ballet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. So you finished uh, 13? Yeah. 13, 14? Wow. Yeah. So you can do some moves still, huh? <laughs> I still remember it like my... It starts to cripple if I watch some dance movies or... <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, with uh, all respect, I would never say that, to, you know, knowing you. And, yeah. like, I would never say that you are the type of person who will start to uh, dance when, ballet for nine yeah, years. when you yeah. see a high school musical or something. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, cool. So, then, uh, back to a volleyball. After the high school, were you happy there? Yes, and at times, no. Like I said, it's a, it's a bubble. Um, and like you basically live and breathe volleyball. You 
wake up in the morning, you go to Volvo practice, then you go to school where your whole class is your teammates and all they think about is Volvo. Then you finish school, you go back to Volvo practice, you go have your dinner to again talk about Volvo most of the time. And then maybe you have a gym session or a pool session, whatever it is. And then in the evening, once you're done with everything, you sit in the living room and you watch Volvo. Okay. <laughs> so if you're not obsessed with volleyball, it's not going to work. Exactly. So you're you're really in this bubble and it's a uh, it was a great environment. We were all very I mean, you live together and you do everything together. So you become like a, a expanded um extended family, but and all very close knit, but at the same time it can get to the point where it gets too much. And it is also just by nature a very competitive environment to be in. Um, for us both, for my class in particular, both on the volleyball court, but also actually at school. Um, we had, I would say, a generally quite high academic level in our class. And it's hard to you have someone who's competitive in their sport and on court, it's hard to also not be competitive in class. So suddenly you have two arenas where where you're competing and and trying to perform at a at a top level. Now when you uh, when you uh, saying this, just one thing came to my mind when in Denmark when I was there on the Hoiskola. So just to explain Hoiskola, do you have the Hoiskola in Norway as well? Is it this like what you do after high school? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So basically it was, I got there on an exchange program from my uni. Yeah. I think to this day, if they knew what we were doing there and how we were getting our credits and all of that, they would never approve it. But yeah. <laughs> nobody ever came for a check. <laughs> they were just sending a couple of students, uh, uh, up to 15 students every, every year. And... Basically, it was you choose your hoiskole with kind of specialization you are after, right? Like there were people who were going only up on gymnastic hoiskole. The whole school was about gymnastics. Yeah. There were artistic ones. There were some about journalism, yeah. whatever. We had uh, we had one that was oriented for movement generally. There were there was CrossFit as a program. Okay. So they had official affiliation that's actually where i started with crossfit because i got enrolled uh, i got an opportunity to sign in and i sign in and then there was parkour basketball dance which was only girls one guy yeah. signed up for it and the first day he was there he changed it because he was the only guy yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had also crossfit as an option so i signed for a crossfit what happened was that basically they locked okay air quotes locked 120 people in age from 18 to 25 because usually the Danish people they just did it for one semester two semesters to figure out what they want with life exactly. and just to enjoy enjoy time but to learn at the same time yeah. that's why the requirements were practically attendance yeah. you know like you come you get you get credits done you yeah. know perfect yeah. <laughs> if you were on a proper uni this was like a dream yeah, because yeah, yeah. you you rather come and not to do much than not to come and then do a shit ton of uh, assignments right and it was fun it was everything was very very uh, like happy spirit uh, oriented but what was happening obviously we are living sleeping training everything under one roof 120 people from 18 to 25 years and no limits So a lot of drama, a <laughs> lot of romance, if you would say, <laughs> yeah, uh, very short term romances yeah. and uh, partying. And uh, even though there are rules around alcohol, but still, like, have you had this kind of dramas? And because that age, I mean, it's a bit younger, but it's not that different, right? Like everybody's hormones are up the roof. You were there with guys, as I understand. Yeah. So guys, girls. So the competitive level was <laughs> in the gym, <laughs> in the classroom, and then you were fighting for guys. At yeah? the dorm room. Yeah. Yeah. Now, like when I mentioned that the class above us had different challenges than, than us, I think they had even more of this romance drama because they were only 20. So 20 mm. for the first year, and then there was um, swapping back and forth. And So there was 20 of them only, only for yeah. a whole year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And how many guys? How many girls? 
I think they were about half half. Um, oh, I do. <laughs> yeah. So I think they had even more of those challenges than mm-hmm. than we did. Um, but yeah, for sure. Like you, it's a very intensified experience, I would say. Because if you if you go to regular high school, then you might go to high school with some of your friends and then maybe you play your sport with some other friends and then maybe you go home and you and your neighborhood has another group of friends again. So you have more of a balance and you can switch and, and mix a bit between and if, if you so, want. If it's not yeah, <laughs> if it's not going great in one social group, you can like detach and, fo- and focus, focus on yeah. another, right? Um, so versus here, you kind of you're stuck in this bubble. There's, it's a two hour boat ride to the closest city. Um, you, you don't have much <laughs> two, options. <laughs> two, two hours boat ride. Yeah. So you couldn't even get there on, on a normal car road. You can, but it's actually further. You have to drive through oh, the mountains yeah, and, yeah. and take a ferry and everything. So the, the fastest would, and what we would do most of the time would be this like, like speed ferry almost that would take two hours to get to the closest city. Um, and, and that city was how big? Well, that city is Stavangers, which is Norway's fourth biggest city. Okay, so, so that, that was there was stuff that to was do. Decent. There was stuff yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, so whenever we would travel, we would do that because we would fly from there. And uh, me, my whole, almost my whole second year, um, back to the unsuccessful attempts at jumping higher, <laughs> I <laughs> suffered from uh, from back pain uh, for quite a long time. And um, there was a long period where once a week I would take the boat two hours, go see a manual therapist in the city for 30 minutes and then wait and take the boat back again. Um, because that Which was, uh, when you were sitting on the boat, it got stiff back again. <laughs> just that the time probably not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> probably also be something I wouldn't recommend these days. But yeah, that's what I did for months, months in a row, I think. Um, and... Like that was how limited our access to to good physios, medical staff uh, was the initial years. Uh, just to finish off with this uh, social social bubble you were creating there, like have you uh, were there were there any like solid dramas like pregnancies or something like that happening? No, I don't think we had any of that. There was a my first year. I mean, um, I, I don't want to say that the pregnancy is a drama, just no, no, but, <laughs> but in that age, in the 15, close school, yeah. Yeah, if you're a 15 year old that moved away from home to play volleyball and come back pregnant, then it's probably going to create a bit of drama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think the only thing that we had in the very beginning, it was one of the first weekends after we, we started our first year. And Luckily, in hindsight, um, me and three other girls from my hometown, we all started at the same time. And we had a, we had a regional competition with our home club team. So we were back home that weekend because uh, we were playing. But that weekend, there was like the first big party where mm-hmm. t- students from the volleyball school and some of the local kids had had this like party and uh so there were also it was like a village yeah of, like okay. i said it's like around 1200 people ah okay 1200 living people. there okay yeah, yeah got so it. the local kids were not that many <laughs> 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 but there were a few and there was this big party and it turned into to a big drama because one of them one of the students ended up overdoing it had to be sent to the hospital and we came back again took the boat back on on sunday and there was called for this like all student meeting sunday evening and the the leader of the academy, uh, I remember, I've never seen him so furious. I thought his like head was going to pop. <laughs> and we were sitting in the back and like still felt horrible, although we hadn't even been there. Um, uh-huh. But I think in a way, maybe it was a good thing because like from that way, from that day on, we were banned from drinking alcohol within the city or within the... Uh, how what uh, age is alcohol legal uh, alcohol is not illegal until you're 18 but, okay um I, I believe in denmark it was 16 for beer yeah uh, so is it same no it's actually 18 
but it's quite common that kids will start I, earlier than I, that. Yeah. I uh, yeah, like I, I just mean the official. Yeah, regulations. the official is eighteen yeah. um, mm-hmm. in Norway. So yeah, so then there was this huge cleanup meeting after that. There was put a full ban on like anyone who's caught drinking alcohol within premises or within the city or the town will be banned off the team, which is the worst you can do. To yeah, anyone who's in the program, the worst than dying, you don't right? get to play volleyball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you get caught drinking alcohol, you're banned from the gym, you don't get to play volleyball, you don't get to compete for X amount of weeks. And that pretty much took care of it because everyone was terrified of not being allowed to play. How how often were you going home? It would vary, but I would say the beginning, maybe once a month, once every two months. Because we, for us, we were fairly close. We were that two-hour boat ride plus a 30-minute drive. Oh, okay. But then we had classmates who would need to fly four hours to get home. Um, after would, the boat. After the boat. <laughs> <laughs> but then we would also, um, especially our second and third year, we competed in the, in the top national league. So we would travel most weekends like during the season. We would travel probably or have games three out of four weekends a month so oh. we wouldn't have that many weekends off so you're training over a whole week plus studying so on and then on the weekends you had games you travel and you play yeah and again because no volleyball is not a big sport no way it tends to be wherever the best teams are it tends to be this like little small local towns <laughs> Mm-hmm. where suddenly someone started a volleyball team and then just grew because okay. uh, it was the only thing to do and then they <laughs> it ends up with a good team so it's not like we would travel and, and play only in the big cities and stuff like that no no we would we'd have to take the boat <laughs> drive to the airport the boat is the basic yeah. take the flight and then maybe take a couple of hours train ride and then another drive to get to where we would play a match and then we do the whole thing in return to get back to the same day mm-hmm. so for one match. For one match. For one match. Uh, how how big is Norway? How many, uh, like roughly, citizens? People, um, yeah. close to five million. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's pretty similar to Slovakia. So yeah. Something about five. But uh, I think you have way. Yeah, the uh, challenge is land. the long distances. Yeah. It's such a such a long country. If you flip it upside down, you end up in Sicily, I think. So oh, it really? Cut, yeah, it's, it's the same length of <laughs> Flip all it of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it's a good measure. So it covers pretty much the length of Europe. So luckily, we didn't have matches too far north mm-hmm. at the very tip, but we still have some fairly far away. A uh, good amount of driving and trains and planes and. Okay, and then. Uh graduated what was next so then i think uh due to a lot my challenges of of a lot of injuries and and struggling to get through these that kind of led me down the path of studying physio okay so that was the that was the trigger yeah you had you said you had the shin splints you had lower back problems yeah, I had shin splints, I had lower back problems, I had a couple of fractured fingers, I had a shoulder f- injury. The back pain was for sure the one that was the most, uh, that bothered me the most and restricted me the most. You said that you triggered that with uh, the attempt for the highest jump ever? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, like looking back at it, um, I'm pretty sure that was also related to load management and like uh, a poor, poor structure when it came to f- like the supporting strength and conditioning training and, and just a lot of factors on top of each other, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So all of those things kind of, I would say is what led me down the path of, of going to physio. Um, and when I started physio, I wasn't very convinced. I wasn't like, this is what I'm going to do and that's it. Uh, but I was kind of choosing between either physio or the Norwegian business school. So quite opposite. Okay. And even after I started, physio won in the end, but even after I started through the, the three years 
in physio, I still reapplied for the Norwegian Business School each year as a backup. So I actually have like three starter packs. Welcome to the Norwegian Business School. <laughs> oh, so each time you did the yeah you, you did the exams again just to get in or no, so application you can, yeah you can apply oh, okay. so each year i would apply to have it as an option and mm -hmm. as a backup because i wasn't very very convinced that physio was what i wanted to do when you had that sport high school like what is generally the vision for that people like to go to because you know like you hyped as shit whole time 20 or uh, 20 hours a week training Uh, tournaments every weekend or pretty much every weekend and then after three years you're expected like okay now life yeah <laughs> you know like or do they do they like expect you to go to play for a university volleyball or what, what is like the next logical step so we don't have like a strong university league or anything like that some of the top league teams are connected to universities But mm -hmm. they're not really university teams. It's more just like they have the university name. <laughs> That's is about there, it. Is there any country in the world who has strong volleyball university like system? The states, only the states the and, and Canada. For was, sure. there, was there a chance that you can get drafted there? Yeah, so that was something that I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, it was something that I would have loved to do, but at the time. Again, like today in the academy, they have the second year students. They all travel to the States, visit several universities, um, build those connections, get to a look and feel of how that is. They have scouts repeatedly coming over from the States um, to look at the, the players and, and draft them directly. So today they have very strong connections. And today also with kind of... Uh, internet and everything that you can do online, it's, it's a bit easier to maneuver. Uh, at the time, I was, again, like pretty lost. What do I do? How do I approach uh, it? And you were second year, so you're, the school was probably not that well known. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. yeah there was no such established connections. Um, so they didn't really prepare you for anything else, just whatever you want. Yeah, you didn't really know where to where to start, what to do. Um, I got as far as I got my coach to help me make a, a promo video where you like film yourself doing certain drills and some games and highlights and stuff like that. <laughs> But then I was like, okay, now what? I <laughs> just copy up the CD and like ship it to the States. <laughs> what do I do with this? So I kind of ended there, which on one side... No regrets because everything has led me to where I am today and, and I'm happy about that. But is it one of the things that like, I wish I would have had uh, that opportunity? Yeah, for sure. So that's also some of the things that we'll get into it. But so, so did you ship it to us? No, I didn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think I still have the CD though. <laughs> oh, well, it's at least a memory, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, so most of the players... Even before graduating, often starts playing for for some of the um, the top league teams. Uh, so a lot of players will continue playing, but volleyball isn't a, a big enough sport in Norway that you can make a live. You don't make a living out of playing volleyball in Norway. No way. Um, you you pay to play, <laughs> basically. Like, oh really? Yeah, I've, I've. I mean, I don't want to sound like that bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, with most teams I've played for, because um, I continued playing uh, the top league in Norway for, for eight years until I moved here afterwards. And mm -hmm. I think only one of those teams would cover all of our expenses. Um, the other teams, uh -huh. we would have to contribute uh, to our tickets when we were traveling or pay for our volleyball license, all of these things. So... You don't, you have to either study on the side or work on the side. There is, if you want to do it full time and, and get paid for it, you have to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. well, I, I mean, uh, I, I can't even imagine that uh, there would be a volleyball team in Slovakia who can make any way close to living. But yeah, like there's only a couple of major sports where this is possible, right? I, I I believe that ice hockey for you, it's one of them where you can actually... 
yeah. possibly make a living. The biggest sports for sure is soccer, uh, soccer and handball, ice hockey. Handball as well. Yeah, handball is very strong in, in Scandinavia. Um, so so handball, um, soccer, some of the winter sports, if you're at a, a, at a top level. Mm-hmm. But volleyball, no. <laughs> uh, so you, you kind of, for the lack of good physio, you decided that you will be the one who will make it <laughs> and you'll uh, make a revolution. <laughs> I think it was yeah. more, I just, I, I think I've always craved kind of knowledge and understanding. I've always been the, the student or the player that wants to know why, why do we do this? What will this help me with? What's the purpose of this drill? What's the purpose of this task? Um, and for things to kind of have meaning and, see the bigger picture and, and connection with If, the things that you do. Yeah, you don't do it just to do it, right? Exactly. You, there's some intent behind it. Exactly. So, so I think I, I still had a lot of things that I wanted to learn and understand and um, expand my knowledge on when it came to kind of my own body, both in terms of injuries, but also in terms of how to make the most out of my physical capacity. Um, so I think that's what drove me down down physio and I knew from the beginning that if I was going to go that route that I would be interested in in working related to sports because again that's what I came from and that's where I I saw it missing and and lacking and um and feel that I was again quite determined to go into now when I then first got to physio I still remember our first on our first day orientation the One of the leaders of the from the faculty, one of the first things she told us, she was like, For those of you that think that you're here and you will end up working only with sports teams and athletes, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> I'm just telling you now. So, so you know. So you know. <laughs> Very encouraging. This is uh I would expect that. You know, we I'm from uh, Middle Europe, but we are part of the Eastern Bloc. So for everybody I'm from the uh Eastern Europe. Uh This is like a, I would expect this in this like old communist way of, uh, you know, setting up, setting up for success. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't expect that you will ever mean something. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah but uh, Tima, she had the same, like she was studying physio in Slovakia and they basically, they came as like, what do you think? Like you will be mobilizing these 80 year old people who are on the brink of dying Sorry, not sorry. Yeah. It's true, you know, and you'll be mobilizing them, turning them. So they live a couple of days longer, but you're not going to like, what do you think? You know, <laughs> what do you yeah. think that you will work with some people who actually, you know, you want to work with? And yeah, like they, they just set you up straight for lowering your expectations straight away, which is, I mean, well, you're proving them wrong now every day. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it wasn't very encouraging, but, uh, and it, It was a theme throughout, I would say. And because a lot of the leadership in the school, they're more, uh, they have their specialties in a different line of physiotherapy and more related to psychomotoric physiotherapy, and, and which is a very completely different field. Um, so naturally they were biased towards that end. But mm -hmm. it should still be a balance. Um, I guess the way that I, kind of still work through it was that whenever we would have the option to choose whether that was what assignment we were writing the topic of it or it was where we were going to do an internship or it was i wrote my bachelor thesis on acl injuries and return to sports like so whenever we would have the option of choosing i'd make sure to 100 of the time pick something that would be sports relevant which also makes sense right because you had basically a pro athlete background. So that makes sense if somebody who has never been doing anything and they just picked physio because it was easy to get there, for example. Yeah. You know, then, yeah, like you you actually had a validation behind it yeah. <laughs> that you, you, you knew what you want. So. Yeah. And that was also something that was quite surprising. I remember on that same first day, 
at some point she asked the question, like, raise your hand, whoever has seen a physio before, or like gone to a physio. And in my head, I was immediately like, what kind of stupid question is that? Of course, you've been to a physio. Have you applied to go to physio? And then it was only about half the class that raised their hand. And I was shocked. I was like, what? Like, you're dying to spend the next four years studying this and you've never even seen one? Like, how did you then end up here? But, but I guess everyone has their their own reasons and, and motivations but that was quite shocking to how me. many of you actually finished I think we started out around 70 oh okay that's a big that's um, a big class yeah well, but uh, and then I think we finished uh, around 50 so we definitely had some drop-offs we had some that uh, transitioned either to Uh, study medicine or study dentistry um we had several that went that direction actually we had some that just dropped off um but yeah but also something and which kind of later led me down uh, more f- towards coaching is that throughout those three years you do three years in school and then you do a full year of internship before you get your your certification Mm-hmm. um so but i would also say one thing that was quite shocking to me was if i were to say how many among my class that i would trust to demonstrate and coach a proper back squat or a deadlift at the end of those three years i would probably say a handful um i mean well i can say it i don't care <laughs> <laughs> i was studying uh, kinesiology Or on my master's bachelor degree, I did something different. But the kinesiology was kind of program created for people who's finished the bachelor in uh, recovery, regeneration and nutrition in sport or something like that. So basically me and maybe one more guy out of 20 ish, 22 people were the only ones who didn't have that background. Yeah. You know, and everybody else had. I would not trust any of them to teach back squat to anybody at the end of the two years of the masters. Like, like they were not coaches. They were great at, uh, you know, following a, a nutritional pyramid <laughs> and all these, uh, kind of for me, definitely outdated, outdated guidelines, but to actually teach and, uh, guide people through the movement and you know we had like massages and we had like different treatments and understanding all the tests you can do you know wingate test and like sh- shit ton of it i was so missing a physical part from my previous studies that anytime we we're doing these tests i was the one who we were doing that because i was like i just want to move you know <laughs> so everybody was uh, learning how to do the wingate test but i was the one doing it you yeah. know and they were just watching and i mean yeah like uh i, if, if Tima is here, she would tell you how many people she would trust out of her class of physios <laughs> to actually like put hands put hands on a person. It's it's terrifying sometimes. What are the intents and the reasons why people actually want to study or do certain thing? Because if there is not that relationship, you know, like you hundred percent more believe a doctor who has a sport background or he looks athletic. Like if I'm coming, well, I'm not coming to any doctor anytime soon, but if somebody, somebody is coming to a doctor and the doctor doesn't care what you eat and sorry, he's fat ass and he's smoking or you feel the cigarettes, like run away. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is not a great person to have a medical advice from, right? Yeah. Regardless of all the degrees, yeah. because the degrees is not everything. No. The the intent behind why is he doing what is he doing and what way he is willing to guide you that that will tell you way more. Yeah, for sure. And and it's a but I think it's a challenge in in a lot of fields and uh, it's a shame and uh, it's slowly catching up. But but I think it will still take a lot of time before it gets to where it needs to be. And I think the challenge is that a lot of a lot of fields, a lot of educations by the time you finish what you learned in school is already outdated. If it's not already outdated before you even start. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I can relate. Yeah. So, but then at the same time, like it can give you the foundation, but I think a lot of people, like if you want to, 
if you want to get to the forefront and you really want to get good at whatever it is you're doing, like you have to be proactive and you have to go after more than just what you learn in school. Uh, if I look at how I work today, I would say that, okay, my school built my foundation, but of what I use on a day-to-day -day basis, probably 90% of it I learned from continuing educational courses that I've done afterwards. I 100% agree. And uh, you, you have a very great point. I would just add that, you know, not only the type of information you're getting or the quality of information you're getting, but the fact that you actually have to memorize information. They don't teach you how to evaluate. I mean, I can Google so much today, you know, 90% will be bullshit. I need to know how to distinguish, yeah. how to distinguish what is true, what is not true, because we don't have a problem with lack of information. Yeah. We have overload of information and people have a problem to actually, that, that's why it definitely happened to you before when people came to you and they knew what's wrong and they knew <laughs> how to treat it and they didn't even know why they actually came, but, yeah. <laughs> but they kind of wanted the validation of what they already think, yeah. like, you know, self-diagnosed. But the most education I got by far was when I was on the mentoring with a strong fit and they were throwing shit at us uh, and in a insane rate because the leader of it was is Ju Julian. He is just, he's on a spectrum for sure. And well, I mean, that he, he tells us that he is, so this, this is not like, uh, you know, yeah. trash talking. <laughs> uh, he's on a spectrum and the rate he is picking up stuff but also jumping from topic to topic. Like we, we had a half a year of insane focus on nutrition. And then from day to day, it was uh, how we can apply computer science and learning how the artificial intelligence learning, how we can apply it for coaching, you know, and it's just like completely different world. But you learn so much because you research, you're not given answers, you're given tasks, and you need to figure it out. And this is super lacking because you, at least what I experienced at school, they came, I had so many fights with our teacher of nutrition because like I was on the keto while I was there, or at least pretty strict paleo diet, which I did as a experiment. I'll oh, we'll see how it goes. And after half a year, I was feeling great. So I just stick to it. And then I was told after four years, being on keto, that keto is experimental and uh, it's not sustainable. And I was like, what? <laughs> so how long do you have to be there <laughs> so it's sustainable? You know, and uh, it was just because they were taught it certain way and they were not following necessarily the, the, latest, the latest research and it just outdated and you're not allowed to question. You only have to repeat what they say. So yeah. Yeah, and I think especially with anything that has to do with like within the medical field, things like constantly change so quickly. New discoveries are made. Um, research is done so rapidly that uh, it's always changing. And you would see clearly in school, we'd have um, kind of our in-house teachers that have been in school <laughs> teaching for the last 20 plus years. Um and then we'd have external they, lecturers coming in mm -hmm. who would still be working clinically um, and massive difference uh, just in the level. Because I think once you get used to teaching something, you you fall into that trap. You just teach and like, this is the way we would teach it. And this is the way you should know it. And this is the information that you need to memorize versus when you're still in in clinic and, and every week working with patients, you know that it isn't that black and white. You exactly. can't just apply the same thing to every single person and it, it will give you the same result. Um, and I remember having a lot of discussions with some of my classmates during physio, especially towards our last year when we had our final exams. And a lot of them would, they would live in the library and they would study facts after like details and like memorize everything from anatomy to uh, all the different diseases and so on and so on. And then I would argue that like, yeah, but it's not like you won't have that access uh, information available to you. If you come across a one in 100,000 case, you will get the chance to look up the information that you need. 
Um, but what's much more important is kind of how you how you work and how you relate to human beings, how you yeah, the are connection. able to, like, uh, your human skills. These are not things that you can study and memorize. You have to f develop them. And, and I was... I remember smiling for myself when we when we had our final exams and the first question on the exam was what do you put in the term clinical reasoning and I could see my, my fellow students like panicking around me they're like but there's no answer for this in the book I didn't read this anywhere mm -hmm. like you actually have to think you actually have to yeah. put your opinion in like what do you put in the term clinical reasoning what does that mean to you um why is that important You actually have to reflect on it rather than just list it up from something that you read in a book. Also, the, the huge difference, as, as you were saying, you had the external people who were actually practicing the field and you had the comparison with, with the theoretical <laughs> uh, practitioners yeah. Yeah, who were stuck there for uh, who knows how many years. I had a couple of classes on the ICU of... Gastro gastrointestinal uh, department, which was like, I mean, that was very strong. You know, you had people with hepatitis just before the uh, transplant of liver and like so much, so much shit you see, experience, you talk to the people. That, that was very interesting. And we also had always a different doctor from the department giving us the lecture. So we saw a lot of differences. Uh, different approaches as well, even within one department, you know. And what was a huge difference, which I think people don't realize that much because we are putting the medicine onto a pedestal a little bit too much, even physios and practitioners. Like, we we are, you are, doctors are people who are going to make mistakes. But only thanks to the making the mistakes, you are learning. And you're not allowed to make mistakes at school. Yeah, so how you learn? You, yeah. Because you only have to learn answer to this specific question. And then somebody will throw you a little bit off the rail because your answer is A, but A is also going to cause them more pain. It's like, what do you do? You know, or allergy, you know, in a food like this is the answer for this kind of problem. Like, no, it's never one answer. But you need to be able to think outside of box and kind of come around with your own approach and solutions, which will lead to you fucking up some people. It will. Like, if there is somebody who is in physio for five or ten years, and they'll tell me, like, they never did a mistake, which would make the case worse, it's bullshit. Then you're not doing it properly. <laughs> you're, you're not doing not, anything. <laughs> yeah, you're not doing anything, because you're not trying, you're not pushing, you know, that's where you learn, when you go a little bit... Does it suck for that one individual? Yeah. Can you learn and try to fix it eventually? Yeah, that's the whole point, right? Like, it's not like everybody's a guinea pig, but at the end, because people are so different, everybody's a guinea pig because you'll never have two exact same cases anyway, so. Yeah, that's so true. And and also kind of leads to one thing that I also wish would be more included is how whether it's it's with your physio or it's with your doctor or it's with your coach like it's a it's a partnership it's a it's a dual communication it's, it's two-way street it's a two-way yeah. street and it's not a i come to see you so you can fix me situation i hate this this perspective and uh for so many reasons but it, it is a partnership at the end of the day like you're the one with your pain or you're the one with your issues and your challenges and, and you need to find someone who who can help you with them and who can guide you through them and who ideally knows more ways to work with them than what you do, which is why you seek them out in the first place. But that doesn't mean that you just go to them and kind of lay down like and hand yourself over. That's what you said. Like you're there to guide and you're there to lead them, but you're not there to fix them. Because exactly. you can't fix anybody. Yeah. People need to fix themselves. This was, Julian was always on the mentoring thing, like if, if somebody, and he was talking about PT clients, and like, they are paying me, I don't owe them shit. They owe effort to me, you know, <laughs> because they seeked my help and I'm doing it this way. 
And if you don't like it, okay, move on. But this is how it works. It's uh, you you will only get. I think it was in Star Wars or wherever. Like, uh, you will only get. He was going into a cave or something, and he told him like, "You will only find what you bring with yourself." Yeah, I know. I didn't even see it. I just know the analogy. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) yeah. You only get what you put in, right? Like you have to be invested uh, and you have to be committed to the process. If not, and you have to be open also, like you mentioned earlier, like sometimes people come in and they already know because they've, they've asked Dr. Google. Um, so they already know what's wrong and they already know what they need. And if you're not willing to give them exactly that, then they're, they're not willing to try or be open to anything else. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a journey and um it's a it's a partnership, like, for yeah. sure. Okay, so back to your back to the timeline of your story. You studied physio. Yeah. You finished physio, and then what happened, or were, how did you actually showed up in here? Yeah, <laughs> and then I, um, I like I mentioned, I did my coaching certification after I finished physio. Um, uh, what kind of coaching certification? Uh, so I did a, through the one of the universities in Norway. I did a, it was one full semester um, for personal training. So which I did in part, I would say mostly more to to have the actual certification and the uh, kind of official side of it. Yeah. Um, but still, it w- it was helpful um, and. Um, I also did uh, a semester in sports psychology, actually, um, which at the time I did more for my own uh, athletic career, uh, more than anything. But there's also been something that's been valuable later on when working with athletes. And because I also think there as well, when it comes to as physios or medical professionals or coaches, like, yeah, the focus, and especially from whoever is coming to you, is often very and only focused on their physical and whatever they want to achieve or whatever they're, they're lacking or struggling with when it comes to their physical and then often neglect the mental component of, of it. Take uh, an athlete who have had an ACL injury on court and are going to return back. It's not just a question of, is that knee ready to go back on court? It's also a question of, are you mentally and emotionally ready to, to go use, back to and, use the knee to use the knee <laughs> yeah. and to go back and expose yourself to those same situations where you had that trauma in the first place um so i've again kind of linking back to i think my own experiences as an athlete i i've always been quite focused on that i want that full circle approach i want i know that there is more to performance and there's more to injuries than just the physical part um so that's part of why i why i also did the coaching certification why i also did the the sports psychology and it's part why why i enjoy so much working as as both i started coaching already from from when i was in physio and studying and then i've coached since so as long as i've worked for i've always had one foot in the clinic and one foot either in the gym or on the court um, as a coach. And I think that's very valuable, uh, not just because it gives me more challenges and variation and keeps it more interesting, but also because it gives me that ability to follow someone through their full journey. So again, back to the athletes who blows his ACL out, I then have the ability to follow him pre-surgery, post-surgery, and all the way back to that court, um, which I think is something that can be lacking a lot of times. You know, uh, there is this funny notion, which I'm uh, noticing around coaching physio, this sport performance community of uh, professionals, that every coach is kind of like, not necessarily pushed, but I believe they should be pushed more. But <laughs> they are like, you know, you should know more about anatomy. You should understand more. You should understand more of that physio part. Not necessarily doing the treatments manually, but I mean, you know, Have knowing 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 what might be the issue. Yeah. Of course, diagnosing it on the spot in the gym, 
that's probably not going to be very precise. However, if it's somebody's shoulder, you should at least know what might be, you know, because sometimes you are there, you see how it happened, you see the mechanism of it. So, so you are the first to talk to about what might be the problem. But at the other side, we should also push physios more to be more coaches, because it's also from my personal experience and from what I've seen around in in Dubai, in Slovakia as well, uh, the ability of physios to actually coach movement is not the best. I, yeah, let's put it this way. Like they could definitely do the verbal, verbal cueing way better. Also looking at the understanding the movement patterns, not only when the person is lying on the back, but <laughs> when they are actually moving. Yeah, which uh, I find very, I mean, uh, now I'm, you know, Oh, putting myself up a little bit. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but it's, it's very true. cool that Timea is physio, which is from that very far end, but she started as a coach or she was kind of coaching yoga and stuff before and it kind of like went together. I'm on the other side where I was really, really into coaching, but then I started to realize I need this more and we just like some, somewhere meeting it together and we always talk about it. We always talk about movement. We always talk about uh, approaches. I'm asking her more the technicalities and uh, stuff, you know, breaking down the muscles and uh, chains and uh, whatever it is. And she's always more uh, asking about, okay, so, but how do I guide them to get this, this, this output, w whether it's physiological of meaning energy systems and so on, or mechanical of actual reaching certain tension in certain muscles. And it works great, you know, because there is, I'm, I can't say that I am the best coach in the world and I am the best uh, kinesiologist or whatever, but I like where I am in a meaning that I have the right proportion for myself, for what I need somewhere in the middle of both. So. Yeah. Yeah, no. And I think that's so true. And um and again something that i i see a lot being in both places um and i think it goes back to some of what we talked about when it comes to like what's the actual education that you get when you want to become a coach or you want to become a physio i think most physios are great and amazing at the initial stages of rehab they're excellent at that first initial um stages but then when it comes to actually the later stages especially again if we're talking about uh, athletes and higher performance um, individuals that have high requirements that they're going so, back to so the later stage you would mean once the rehab part is kind of getting towards the end and you need to start to load it more and exactly. actually actually get them back to the game exactly because yeah. there is a there is a long way from doing a, a seated knee extension um to being on a tennis court or on a volleyball court um a competing crossfit athlete like there is a big gap there and i think that often doesn't get addressed and when it doesn't get addressed suffers at the end of the day the athlete um, so, and then on the other side, from, from a coach's perspective, they're maybe great at that final stage. Um, they know way much more, uh, about, uh, exercise prescription. A lot of physios tends to go with three times 10 on everything. Um, <laughs> that's just what you give <laughs> and that's what you stick with throughout. Uh, there is no change. But so on that end, coaches are often way more knowledgeable and have a broader um, repertoire when it comes to exercise selection and all of these things. But then on their side, again, they might be fine as long as they have a healthy athlete. And then as yeah. soon as something starts creeping up, either that's kind of pain in nickels or an injury happens, usually one out of two happens. Either one, they do nothing and they adjust nothing and then that tends to make matters worse at some point or two they will completely not want to touch it so they'll mm. be like go see your doctor go see your physio we're not training until your physio says even it's a okay. minor thing even yeah. it's a minor thing and that again is also not necessary and actually counterproductive 
uh, where in most cases there's easy adjustments that can be made and you'd be able to continue without having that abrupt stop that will often set you back even more. When you put it like this, I'm, I'm just thinking that coaches are probably way, if they don't put hands out and they want to try, like they are way likely to experiment than physios. In a in a meaning of variation and just try this, just try this, and let's see, you know, like the like they they don't have that fear of messing it up too much yeah. until they have the fear and they will not touch it at all. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> until they have that one person where it gets like ten times worse, and then they're like, okay, I'm not touching this anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think there on both ends there is a there is a gap to be filled, and I think some of that responsibility lies on the educational institutions that that you go through but also there's for sure some responsibilities that each one has to take um but this this gap and this lack of integration between the two is something that frustrated me and i suffered from uh, as an athlete myself and again something that i've seen for the last decade working in both places over and over and over and over again And going back to the timeline, that's where Bulletproof was born. <laughs> okay, so that's how it started, yeah? Yeah. Okay, when you touched on it, what is Bulletproof Performance? So Bulletproof Performance is um, my attempt at trying to bridge that gap, um, trying to integrate um, all aspects of, of performance, injury prevention and rehab together and and kind of try to integrate everything uh, better. And at the same time, doing that in a way that educates and empowers the athlete at the end of the day. Because again, like uh, that's one of the things that I value the most in, in the job that I do is uh, being able to pass on knowledge and being able to enable someone to do the things that they have to do. Going back again to that, it's not a I fix you situation. It's I guide you and I help you and I support you. But at the end of the day, if you don't put in the work, no magic's gonna happen. Um, so that's what it is on a high level, <laughs> on a practical level. Um, it is a online platform. We've targeted it specifically towards volleyball players. Uh, so it's an online platform that offers a physical training program that aims to tie the two together, sports performance and injury prevention baked into one um, that's specific to the sport and its movements and its challenges. And at the same time, also tailors to the competition schedule and the different parts of the, the season. Um, and then we have a lot of educational resources Um, trying to, again, tie in all aspects. So we bring in experts on mental performance, on nutrition, rehab, prehab, physical performance, and even career-related. Going back to when I was trying to, would have liked to go to the States mm. to play college, um, we're working on, on bringing in experts who can make that an easier step and a less lonely and confusing path to try to find. Um, but so, so basically educating players on what might be your next possible step in your career exactly through some professionals who know what they're talking about works with this yeah or, so okay. either kind of how do you take the step to to play college volleyball or how do you take the step if you wanting to if you're in a country where volleyball is not a professional sport mm -hmm. but you wanting to take that step to go semi-pro professional how do you work with an agent What should you look for? You're saying that it's mainly or only exclusively for volleyball players, but these kind of general stuff outside of movements, challenges, and uh, that, that can be useful for absolutely anybody, right? Yeah. So I say ma majority and mainly volleyball players, because if you come to me as a, as a tennis player and say, I want to be a better athlete, then 90% of what's in there is still going to be very valid for you and help you mm -hmm. help you do that. Um, I also work with a few athletes one-to-one. -one. Right now I have two basketball players, for example, and there, there is a huge overlap when it comes to volleyball. The movement uh, requirements are very similar, multi-directional movements, start stops, jumps, lands. So there is a lot of crossover. But do you 
do you also teach specific movements of volleyball? Is it part of it too? Or it's basically strength and conditioning that can be applied to many platforms like this, like for basketball, for volleyball, for whatever other sport is using a similar, you know, I don't know, tennis or whatever. Yeah, no. So it's just uh, the physical strength and conditioning part of it. We don't do volleyball skill training. Um, we leave that to the volleyball coaches. Um, well, I, I mean, I would uh, assume that that's the right way uh, to do it because then, yeah, okay, do you do it as a group or individual or both? Um, a little bit of both, mainly, um, the platform is, um, has a program that you follow on your own as an, as an individual. Um, and then, like I mentioned, I also do some one-on-one, -on -one, uh, more closer and more tailored coaching. Um, and then occasionally if there are like recently we had, uh, an Italian beach volleyball coach, um, five-time Olympian coach that was here to run a beach volleyball camp. And during that camp, I ran a couple of sessions on uh, like training preparation and recovery. You brought the coach here? No, Or, one oh. of the, the local volleyball academies. Ah, okay. So, and, and you, yeah, and you jumped in and yeah. uh, did your bit there. Yeah. Okay. So in those settings, a bit of group work as well, but mostly individual. Mm -hmm. And so, so it works like kind of a subscription community thing online? Yeah. So the platform works, works like that. The one-on-one, -on -one, uh, like a normal one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, there I have a combination of uh, athletes that are locally based. And then we might do a bit of a hybrid. Um, with anyone I work with one-on-one, -on -one, we start off with a full movement screen um, during the intake process. And if someone is based here, then I would prefer to do that live mm -hmm. um when it's possible but i also have players that are located in the other um uh, locations around the world so then we do it uh all virtually mm -hmm. so so it's not only for local people it's all around the world yeah yeah what is your demographic do you, do you have any da data on that um very mixed okay <laughs> at the moment we have uh which is cool and kind of unexpected uh when we when we first launched it we naturally because i've been here for seven years and i've played volvo here for seven years so have a good amount of connections and and players that been involved with through the years here so we naturally have people from here but we have um players from australia from california from portugal Um, I recently started working with uh, the captain of the Indian national team, indoor team. Oh, um, nice. Which is cool. It was uh, his wife, actually, who's a trainer, who reached out to us and said, listen, like, there's very few coaches in, in India that works specifically with volleyball. They just do general strength and conditioning, bodybuilding type of um programs and i would really like him to oh my God. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i would really like him to work with someone who who tailors a bit more specifically to the sport so so that was cool they actually reached out to us and we started working with him they've they're he's now has a has a training phase leading up to um they're approaching the asian games so okay. building up towards that It's not necessarily only for professionals, right? Like no. professional athletes. Far from, really. Uh, our target is more anyone who is from a higher junior level, uh, ambitious hobby player um, mm -hmm. to a semi-professional level. It depends a bit. Again, like we want it to be something that can be accessible uh, regardless of where you are, what your level is, or what your financial situation is. Um, that is our our goal. Because um, again, volleyball not being, not being a sport that I would say very few people get into volleyball for financial reasons. <laughs> It's not like yeah. soccer or tennis or yeah, golf yeah. or whatever. You don't get in there to play with get rich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's yeah. not why you play volleyball. You play it for the love of the sport. And then, yeah, if you're at a really high level, there are places where, where you can make a decent living out of it. But 
that's only when you get to the very, very, very high levels. And when you get to that high levels, you'll usually have the support system that you need in place. But anything below that, and even at the highest level, like for me in Norway, um, probably similar in Slovakia, we have a national team player from Malaysia, the guy in India, like in countries where volleyball isn't a strong sport and isn't a sport that, that gets a lot of funding, even if you're at a higher level, you won't have access to, to these people. As a, as a part of uh, uni, I was working with a local, I mean local, it was second biggest city in Czech Republic, but it's still, you know, a basketball team, which was playing the national league. And no, I don't even know how many, but very many of them were not uh, even speaking language, like like nothing. There's, I remember one guy, I believe he was from either Croatia or Serbia, And there were some, uh, I believe there were some black guys as well. You know, these teams are just uh, bringing anybody who can help them and who is willing to come. <laughs> yeah. So when you, wh who is the, what is the youngest member you have? Do you know? Mm, not 100% sure. Um, but I would say kind of our target uh, would be from around like 15, 16 So that would be your target yeah, yeah. for the for the youngest yeah mm -hmm. uh, and then we have players I know we have players into kind of the late 50s uh, oh, nice. who are then uh, more in the program because they want to be able to continue to play the sport they love mm -hmm. so they're more in it because they want something that allows them the longevity to continue to enjoy the game um, so yeah we have quite a, a widespread uh target in that sense but i think going back to the <laughs> the bodybuilding program like it it's very common like uh i would say the two biggest mistakes that i see is either one people only play the sport and don't do any physical training um at all and that might work right when oh, you're 20 <laughs> <laughs> before he started crossfit <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that might work great when you're 20 and your body kind of bounces back from whatever shit you throw at it. But uh, to, a, to a degree, right? To a degree. Yeah. Um, it will still put a cap on, on your performance. But once you, especially once you start getting older, you don't get away with that anymore. Especially not when you're in a sport that has high physical demands. <laughs> Um, so that would be kind of mistake number one. And then mistake number two is that maybe the athlete does strength train, but they do a typical bodybuilding program that they found online. Well, you know, it's, yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm always thinking about the mechanism, how people get into it, you know, and when you go and you put to a Google, how to build body for volleyball bodybuilding you know yeah. building body yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, i don't know like i, I yeah, don't or know they have a friend who strength trains and then they bring them and they go with them and for they... me for me it was always kind of a common sense that probably more sport specific preparation is going to give you more sport specific results right but apparently not everybody's thinking like that and uh yeah let's say you're the minority <laughs> Yeah, I I don't know. It was just like somehow always somewhere there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I know where I uh, got that crazy idea that yeah. <laughs> it might work. Uh, I think it's often like depending on on who you have around you and what you get introduced to, right? Like so, I'll also see volleyball players, football players, tennis players, and then I ask them what you do for strength training, and then they'll tell me CrossFit. I'm like okay, but okay, that will give you might be a better option than the pure bodybuilding program <laughs> to some Again, degree. To a degree. <laughs> to a degree. But yeah. that's not going to help you when you want to step sideways. Um, But, you know, uh, this is, this is uh, I, I think I was talking about this before on the podcast, but anyway, this needs to be clarified for everybody because like how CrossFit actually started was that Greg Lessman found out because he was a gymnast enjoyed weightlifting because some friend taught him and he also enjoyed long bike rides and he kind of noticed that there are these three modalities right and that's uh, gymnastics meaning anything with your own body then weightlifting meaning anything with an external load 
and but running in a weight vest is still running. Yeah, just <laughs> just to, uh, <laughs> there are some uh, gray areas for understanding. And then the last one would be the what they call in CrossFit a monostructural, which is running, biking, rowing, uh, skipping on the and so on, and uh, where you have like repetitiveness on a different degree. And he noticed that because he wasn't excelling in any, but he was doing kind of all of it. it. It gave him fitness where he always beat it. Any specialists, if there was some overall kind of activity, right? But when he created the program, it was for mainly meant to be for fighters, military, uh, firefighters, and uh, police officers, and so on. So they kind of are ready for everything, yeah. And then some people, let's say powerlifter or but hobby powerlifter came to him and he started to do crossfit workouts, which gave him the endurance he was lacking. And then a marathoner came and it gave him the strength he was lacking because it always pushed the weakest link to a kind of uh, unified level, right? But it was never considered and I don't even think that anybody ever said that it's a strength conditioning program great for professional athletes and if you do it you will be just uh, you know top, top top on your class because yes it might give you something depends what your professional sport is but eventually it will become a, it will it will become the break because you need more specific you don't need to be jumping on a box with a 30 kilo weight vest, right? You need to be able to jump 20 times or I don't know how many per game, pretty fairly high. So it's just the specificity was never meant as a background of CrossFit. It was actually the general physical preparedness. So it's a misunderstanding in the whole concept from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's true. Like, like you said, if you if your background is nothing, yeah. then then doing something is always going to be better than doing nothing, and it's going to get you. It's going to help you, and it's going to improve your level, but to a, a certain certain level, uh, and then you're most likely going to stagnate there unless you go more specific, um, and that goes both from a from a performance perspective and from an injury prevention perspective, like you need to consider if you're playing sports, uh, you need to consider the specific movement patterns and requirements of that sport, both again, performance and injury prevention. Um, yeah. There was, there was this uh, guy, Chris Inshaw, and he, he's now running CrossFit aerobic capacity course which is, uh, he was second on Hawaiian Ironman. Like, amazing. Just, uh, supposedly, I don't know much about it, but supposedly it's one of the toughest ones because of the weather and uh, the country you're running through, the heat and everything. And uh, he was second there. And then in his late 40s, if not early 50s, he started to come to a CrossFit gym and it miraculously fixed him. Because he was doing way more strength training than before. He had a great coaches. Actually, I believe that it was uh, Jason Kalipa's gym uh, where, where he started. And he was just he was just getting all the benefits that he was neglecting for that 20, 30 years because he never did that strength. So yes, for him, it was great. And because sometimes there was a running in the workout, you know, then he was... He was winning that because he was great at running, but it was filling filling the gap. But to a what degree are you s trying to absolutely to a point maximize the performance in certain sport, or you just want to like Khalid I, when I mentioned him, or you just want to have healthy shoulders, good vertical jump, and enjoy beach volleyball for three to five times a week, and you need some complementary exercises to that that can also be crossfit but don't expect that that crossfit is going to make you a world champion in the uh, in the beach volley right yeah yeah i wanted to ask you one more thing which is super unrelated uh but you are a physio and i uh, want to know your opinion 
I've uh, I was reading on some stuff and uh, also then start to kind of observe people around me where there are certain claims that a tattoo is changing movement patterns and basically killing killing your movement and eventually maybe also creating a huge problems because the repeated needling yeah well needling <laughs> it's yeah. a kind of yeah the repeated impact especially when it's very painful for whatever reason if it's the area or somebody is just more sensitive or you have a bad day so you're more sensitive yeah. <laughs> like that painful stimulus will completely because it's so much so much in a big area mm. let's say it will completely shut down the neur neural pathways as you know them and it will completely change the movement pattern and then i had couple of talks with many people and uh, what one example for all one lady came to me and i believe she was like a national player of some rocket sport i don't know what i don't know where she was from we only met once and uh, this is also a funny ending there and she was uh, she wanted to go back to sport because she got an opportunity to play again and she was inactive for a couple of years and she was asking me if i can help her as a for a strength and conditioning and as, as we were talking i just looked at her and i was asking about injuries and she's like yeah right ankle right knee right hip right elbow right shoulder everything on the right side and when i was looking at her because it was in dubai she had i don't know like a tank top and shorts and she had a couple of tattoos so i asked her like is this tattoo on your arm the only one you have and she was like no no i have one more on the hip and one more on 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 my on my foot and i was like all on right side like, yeah like all your injuries on the right side and it's like huh <laughs> i never thought about it like that you know and it's uh, it's somehow i know have you heard of this have you encountered this um i haven't i would say i would have to read your study first of all yeah, that, that's uh, not a, it's basically a theory i don't believe okay. there is any study oh, on it it's just something that i started to ever since notice Looking and into. it's somehow you know confirming yeah. the theory i think like with everything uh most things tends to be multifactorial and there's a lot of things to to consider endless often <laughs> um will i say that like could it have an impact in theory um for sure like our skin is our biggest organ and um and the amount of sensory stimulation and input that happens through our skin is massive um and i'm sure that are certain things like when you mention in terms of pain and and pain mechanisms as well that that can link back to that um it's quite common for example that if someone's had a previous injury in an area that especially if it's been a very traumatic or painful experience when they had that injury that area tends to come back up again right mm -hmm. um not necessarily uh, from a from a tissue perspective you can have tissues that have completely healed through that area but it will still keep coming up again and most of us will have that area it's like oh it's always my back yeah it's always my neck it's always my shoulder like that keeps coming up again whenever something's going on and um what that often tends to be is just that your brain remembers that experience remembers what happened right we have this saying that your tissues heal but your nervous system remembers mm -hmm. if you put your hand on a hot plate when you're little your hand is going to heal unless you've kept it there for too long. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you're never going to do that again, right? Because your brain is going to remember and learn from it. And it's our, the way that uh, our brain works and the main reason for pain is often to guide our, our behavior. It's learning. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's our body's way of communicating very often. So it can be that... Uh, when you've had this experience in the past around a certain area that your brain remembers that and it's going to be a bit extra attentive around that same area to be a little bit extra cautious around that area making sure that you don't end up in that same trouble yeah <laughs> which it, it, can it, was, it was sometimes like tattoo on the hip 
And it, it might be random, of course, but like tattoo on the hip, blow up knee, you know, tattoo on the shoulder blade somewhere, you know, at the back and towards the neck, always problem with the left side, you know, just these kind of uh, little connections, but yeah. uh, it might be even cross pattern eventually. So Yeah. And it might also be some connection, like in theory, you can maybe connect it to some of the same mechanisms that happens with scar tissue, for example. Um where that will have an impact on uh, your connective tissue throughout your full kinetic chain uh, and can then cause um, issues in the surrounding areas, uh, but not necessarily right around the scar tissue. So there might be some connection there as well, but it's, it's not a connection that I've read into <laughs> so I'm not going to dare to say too much yeah, yeah, sure. about it but but around the, the pain mechanisms for sure um, because there there is a, a quite well known link that if you've had this pain traumatic experience in an area before your body's naturally going to be more attentive around it and you'll often have a lower threshold for what will trigger pain through that area um like for me going back full circle my lower back it's my area okay. it's my first tell uh mm -hmm. and often it can just be that something in my total situation is out of my normal and then that will be my first tell even emotionally even emotionally um, so it can be like, if my, if my sleep has been off and my stress levels have been through the roof, often my back will start hurting <laughs> and it's then just your body's way of kind of trying to force some change and get some attention about what's the situation that's going on. I, uh, I coach this lady and she, it's a constant fight with her shoulder. Yeah. And, uh, when she goes to holiday, two days, one day before she leaves, Nothing. Gone. Whole holiday, gone. Day before holiday, when she's uh, she, when she already knows she's coming back to work yeah. and everything, straight straight up there again. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. What what do you do, right? Yeah. Well, stress management and and this and this, but life is always happening. So yeah, yeah. No, when it comes to pain, but that could probably be a whole other podcast. Pain's my favorite topic. <laughs> okay, let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. So, but that's uh, if you will, hole. if you will find some uh, other couple of hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, actually ask you, wh where are you heading now? Well, now it's it's growing the bulletproof performance baby. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we have a lot of plans um, and a lot of exciting things that that we're doing with that and that we want to continue to do. Um, uh, like I mentioned, it's something that we we want to make sure is as accessible as possible to anyone, regardless of where and what their circumstances are. So one thing is we've partnered with this nonprofit organization called Let's Keep the Ball Flying, which is an amazing organization that it's an umbrella organization. So they support multiple projects um, that are linked around social development projects but linked to volleyball uh, in different locations. So they, for example, have a, a ref refugee project in Greece. They have a war project in Syria. They have a women's empowerment project in Pakistan and Nepal. Oh, wow. Um, they That's do, a broad scope. <laughs> yeah, they do a lot of amazing work. Uh, so we partnered with them and, and we're working on continuing that partnership and building that out. Um, we have a lot of players from their projects in uh, in our program as well, uh, which is great. And then, yeah, we have a lot of things that we want to do with it. Um, when, when you say we, who is we? So I'm actually partnered with a Brazilian couple, uh, Carlos and Natalia. They're both professional indoor volleyball players. Uh, I've played together with Natalia for a couple of the local clubs here. Right now they're in France because Carlos has played in France this season. Mm. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's so it's team. not uh, so there is more people to manage all this. Yeah. Yeah. That's the team. <laughs> when w would you in future consider also going like maybe bringing people from a different fields and doing the same for different sports? It's funny. I've actually been 
ask that. Um, I actually had a, a professional rugby player from South Africa who mm -hmm. emailed me and said, why don't you do this with me in rugby? <laughs> Well, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, let's let's get this off the ground first, and then yeah, maybe that would be cool. Um, and I've had the same question from um, from my tennis coach. Um, I started playing tennis a couple of years ago um, while we first started building bulletproof. And I, was like, I need this for tennis. <laughs> I have so many students. I need them. Well, to you can you can kind program. of like I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you how to run your business, of course. <laughs> But I mean, like a franchise, you know, that you kind of manage it. You have some framework, you have some outlines, some rules, and then you outsource outsource that. Could be interesting because as you're saying, like, you know, you just mentioned what you do and everybody in their field, if they are in some particularly specialized field, like, oh my God, why are we not doing this for us? Why are we not doing this for this? this sport yeah like i could tell you that there would be a massive interest in doing it for golf for sure yeah, yeah? so if you will want to expand to golf let me know yeah. <laughs> i know some people <laughs> yeah and i mean it's a it's cool and it's a good indication that uh it's something that there is a need and a want for um which is which is nice um I think for now and for the foreseeable future, we probably have enough on our plate. Um, we have a lot of inter internal things that we are are planning on doing just um, when it comes to expanding within volleyball as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's always a question of like going back to the kind of educational part of it and, and wanting to empower more players. But how do you do that? kind of on a larger scale. So one of the things that I would love to include more in the future is uh, visiting clubs, academies, doing seminars, workshops for their coaches, for them to be able to implement more of the things into their day-to-day -day training. Like kind of uh, mentoring, not for the not for the end players, yeah, but the coaches. Yeah, for the coaches. That would be something that would be great to do because uh, it's, Again, it's like you can you can do small tweaks and changes that will have a big impact. Um, and yeah, like this way, this way you impact the end player, right? You impact exactly. one coach, you impact the whole team. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's definitely something that we'd love to do in the uh, in the future. Um, I've actually had a couple of requests the last few weeks where we might already start doing that a little bit, um, similar to what we did with the with the previous beach volleyball camp. So that'd be cool. Um, and then we'll see. Cool. Do you have anything you want to talk about or add? No, I think we've covered quite a lot, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna start on the whole pain discussion. No, no pain. We will, yeah. we will keep pain for the next time. <laughs> uh, we'll set up a date and we'll do the pain. Yeah. Cool. Once you open that topic, I can go on for a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And maybe I'll, I'll think about it, but maybe we can bring some uh, some other person as well. Yeah. Let's see. Somebody with a lot of pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have that. Okay, Anya, uh, thank you so, so much. It was very interesting, very insightful. And uh, well, see you next time. Thank you for having me.